right, can everybody hear me? Are we good with audio? Okay. So we're gonna start, we're gonna give it just a couple more minutes to let some more participants, uh, participants join in and then we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Liz. I'm with uh, Boston Scientific, and I'm uh, here hosting the advancements in the treatment of pain um, that's presented by Dr. Duran from the Pain Institute of Southern Arizona. So I just to give you a couple um, housekeeping tips before we get started. Uh, everybody will be on mute, um, and the cameras will be turned off. Um, besides the presenter, Dr. Duran. And um, if you do have questions that you want uh, addressed, you're more than welcome to type them in in the Q&A um, chat function below. So just type them in the Q&A box and then Dr. Duran will definitely go through those questions uh, after his presentation and address those. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Um, Duran to start the presentation. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, my name is Dr. Marco Duran, and as Liz had alluded to, I'll be talking about advancements in the treatment of chronic pain. 
So the focus of this presentation is going to be primarily on lumbar or low back spinal stenosis, the definition of which I'll go over in greater detail shortly. Um, and as she mentioned, my name is Marco Duran. Uh, I am a fellowship trained in interventional pain management. Uh, and I you know, did that training after an anesthesiology residency. So thankfully I am uh, able to wear uh, many hats, one of which is anesthesiologist and one is a pain management physician. So uh, I did my medical, just a quick overview. So you guys know that, uh, you know, I'm essentially qualified to do this procedure. Uh, my name is Marco Duran. Uh, I went to medical school, thankfully in the great city of Tucson, uh, University of Arizona College of Medicine. I uh, did my anesthesiology residency at Case Western Reserve University uh, and also had the opportunity to practice uh, trauma anesthesiology during training as well. Uh, immediately after, I uh, was accepted to the University of Illinois Chicago Medical Center uh, to perform and uh, undergo the training for my interventional pain training. So uh, I'd like to quickly go over our vision statement uh, with the Pain Institute of Southern Arizona. We try to uh, practice with this in mind at all times. So through compassion and innovation, we will make a meaningful difference in the lives of individuals and communities at large. So the objectives of uh, today's presentation, uh, primarily it's going to be understand pain presentation of spinal stenosis, the details of which I will go over in greater detail. Uh, understanding there are many ways to treat spinal stenosis with varying efficacy or effectiveness. Also, I will uh, go over uh, a good understanding of what Vertiflex is, how it can help patients who suffer from spinal stenosis primarily in the lower back, and also identify other procedures that may potentially help patients if uh, you are not a candidate for this procedure. So have any of you patients have uh, this feeling, sciatic pain in the legs, so severe, can't walk more than 100 feet without having to sit down, pain meds stopped working, something needs to give, nothing really seems to work. I just stay home now, I don't go out and do things can't get all the way around the store, tried medications, and unfortunately, as a consequence, unable to concentrate, didn't wanna be on medications like that. My goal primarily is going to be improving quality of life and not essentially putting a Band-Aid on a primary disease process and disallowing improvement overall in your quality of life. So another patient that had mentioned uh, pain in the hip was so bad, tried cortisone injections in the thigh, tried burning the nerves on both of my hips. Pain didn't get better even with these interventional treatments. And other patients had mentioned, felt numb and tingling in the hip, went all the way down the leg to the foot, started years ago, but is becoming worse. And if you uh, draw, uh, draw your attention a little bit over to the right side of the screen, uh, pain walking or standing and relief with bending over slightly or sitting. I will go over why exactly that uh, seems to give you appreciable benefit if this is the case. So you're not alone. The impact of spinal stenosis affects so many people, millions of people. This can result from aging, wear and tear, degenerative processes on the spine, and uh, it can be from everyday activities. So it's not necessarily the bodybuilder or the paratrooper that uh, gets this type of issue and disease process. It affects more than 14 million Americans. It is the most common in patients over the age of 60 as a result of degenerative processes. And it is the number one reason for spinal surgery in patients over the age of 65. If this condition is left untreated, it can unfortunately worsen over time as it is degenerative in nature and it can significantly restrict a person's mobility as well as their quality of life. And of course, as I'll allude to uh, throughout the presentation, we want to be compassionate with our patients and improve their quality of life through innovation. And thankfully, uh, we have been able to partner with this great device company to allow us to perform this uh, incredible innovative procedure. So what is lumbar spinal stenosis? This is defined as a gradual narrowing of the space in the spine where the nerves pass through. 
So the narrowing can cause a pinching of the lower back nerves as they exit the spinal canal on either side. This can result in a multitude of different types of pain issues, numbness, tingling, weakness, and uh, quite obviously pain in either one or both legs, as well as within the lower back. Relief can be experienced with bending forward slightly or sitting. So as I had mentioned before, when you lean forward, essentially what you're doing is opening up that spinal canal that doesn't really have too much leeway as a result of this disease process, which is spinal stenosis. If you draw your attention a bit more over to the right side on the very uh, upper area, you see that there is a demonstration of a healthy nerve. And immediately below, you see the disc, which is essentially a cushion in between the very dense bones that allows for a gradual uh, or rather an opening or a maintenance of the opening of the spinal canal. <clears throat> if this opening is degenerated or decreases significantly, it can lead to a pinched nerve. And unfortunately, uh, the pinched nerve can send pain signals that radiates or shoots down into the lower back as well as into the legs. So have you tried any of these options still have pain? There are many options for patients who do have spinal stenosis with varying uh, effectiveness. Conservative management is usually tried first and foremost, including physical therapy uh, and epidural steroid injections can be trialed as well to assist with the inflammation within the spinal canal and allow for more room for those nerve roots that cause the shooting pain that radiates down the legs to swim rather than being pinched as was demonstrated on the previous graphic. Um, also, eventually, opioid medications can be helpful for the right patient. Uh, spinal cord stimulation, which is, and I'll go over this a bit more in detail at the, towards the end of the presentation, but it essentially is a therapy that has been tried and true to decrease the pain signals from the lower back and also the nerve roots on either side, and it disallows those signals from going up into the spinal cord and being processed by the upper cerebral functions or the brain functions. Also, uh, there are many patients, I'm sure, that have already had spinal fusions, and this can be effective for a lot of patients to alleviate their pain complaints consistent with lumbar spinal stenosis, like I'm talking about. But quite obviously, spinal fusion is a bit involved, and it would require uh, you know, quite a bit of recovery. Um, so thankfully, this is a bridge, or the VertiFlex procedure is a bridge to allow for an alleviation of pain without having to undergo a spinal fusion. Also, another option would be radiofrequency ablation, and many patients who have primarily low back pain can be great candidates for this, and that is a procedure, once again, that I'll go over a bit more in detail further down the line, uh, but this is essentially buzzing nerves and essentially causing a nick of those nerves to where they are unable to send those pain signals up into the spinal cord and into the brain for processing. So the Superion VertiFlex implant, it is a procedure that can bridge the gap between conservative treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, naproxen, ibuprofen, meloxicam, epidural steroid injections, which can be very helpful for long-term and it is a minimally invasive type of procedure, but a lot of patients don't have their pain alleviated by this procedure. Also, uh, with mild stenosis or narrowing, uh, opioids can be helpful to essentially disallow those pain signals from going up into the spinal cord or at least not being processed as severe pain. Um, patients with moderate stenosis uh, I'll go over a bit more in detail, but once it goes a bit further into the severe stenosis atmosphere, then we start talking about a laminectomy where essentially a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon will remove the elements in the back portion or posterior aspect of where the spinal cord sits and allow for more mechanical room and opening of that spinal canal. Quite obviously, that is a bit more involved, and the VertiFlex Superion implant allows us an ability to bridge the gap. Uh, so it helps with 
allowing an alleviation of this pain without having to go all the way down the line of a laminectomy infusion. Um, and the benefits of this, it, uh, essentially a patient who has severe stenosis and needs a laminectomy or may need a laminectomy, but they may not be surgical candidates for one reason or another. Um, this is a potential uh, beneficial procedure that will allow for an alleviation without having to go to laminectomy. Um, also, it treats central canal, so the actual spinal cord area, as well as the lateral recess just off of midline uh, where the nerve roots begin to exit, and as well as the foramen, which is the opening uh, on the outside aspect of where the nerves finally exit the vertebrae or the low back bones. So the VertiFlex procedure. It's a simple, thankfully minimally invasive treatment. It can provide effective long-term relief. And those three letters, FDA approved, thankfully uh, allows for a safe endorsement of this procedure for patients who are appropriate candidates. It allows for a very small incision. It is a same day procedure, or we say outpatient procedure, meaning that you would come in on that day have the VertiFlex procedure performed, and you would walk out essentially that same day. It would not require an in-hospital stay, an overnight stay, as traditionally has been necessary for a laminectomy infusion. This does not require removal of any bone or any tissue whatsoever. It is a very quick recovery time. There are very, very low risks of infection or other complications and it can provide long lasting relief, especially in conjunction with other strategies. This treatment has been performed on more than 10,000 patients since 2016. And the graphic on the right, it shows you how you may have a pinched nerve in the lower back as it exits the spinal canal before the VertiFlex procedure, which unfortunately many patients do experience. And after the VertiFlex procedure, what essentially is done is the device itself opens up the spinal canal, even millimeters, and that will allow for a massive alleviation of the pain secondary to these pinched nerves. <clears throat> so patient selection is of absolute paramount importance. Patients must have a diagnosis of moderate lumbar spinal stenosis. They must have a leg buttock or growing pain that is relieved or alleviated in flexion, meaning when you either sit down or lean forward while standing, you get an immediate relief of this pain. And this leg buttock growing pain must be persistent. Moderately impaired function is unfortunate consequence of a, uh, a pinched nerve and patients must be able to sit for 50 minutes and walk at least for 50 feet without pain. If they have any more than that, uh, you know, impaired function, then we may need to look at alternative treatments. Patients must have also undergone at least six months of conservative treatment without significant relief, meaning non anti-inflammatories have been tried, physical therapy has also been trialed, as well as other minimally invasive or conservative management strategies before uh, determining your candidacy for this procedure. So this procedure is obviously not for everybody. Patients must have back, or about patients who are not candidates rather, uh, are those which only have back pain. So if it is primarily just a low back pain, no radiating pain or shooting pain into the extremities or your legs, then this procedure may not be for you, but that's not to say that there are not other options that I can uh, describe in more detail soon. Patients that have pain in all positions. So if you can't get comfortable in a flex position, leaning forward doesn't help, leaning over a shopping cart does not help or sitting does not help, there may be something else for you rather than this procedure. Patients that have spinal instability. Uh, so this will be more for me or your uh, primary physician or your pain physician uh, to determine your candidacy for. We would do x-rays as well as a measurement of the density within your bones to ensure that you would be a great candidate for this. Patients with scoliosis that is greater than a 10 degree Cobb angle, and not to belabor the point, but 10 degrees is a, uh, a very important number with respect to the scoliosis angle. 
And this would disallow, if it is greater than 10 degrees at that target level, the appropriate placement of the vertiflex. And patients with osteoporosis may not or will not be candidates for this procedure, as the procedure does require a stable spinous process. It's one of the bones that allows for this device to be uh, nice and stable and open up that spinal canal uh, mechanically for you. So the checklist that I go over for patients who may be candidates for this procedure, they must have a thorough history and physical examination. They must have lumbar flexion and extension film. So essentially this means we would take a, or at least order a low back x-ray, but it may be a bit different from the low back x-rays that many of you have already had done. This is an x-ray that is performed when patients are standing and in extension. So when you lean back, the radiographer will take a picture as well as leaning forward, the radiographer will uh, take a picture in that, um, that position as well. This is to help rule out instability of the bones that would disallow an appropriate and safe placement of this, uh, this device. Also, patients must have a recent lumbar MRI or a low back MRI in order to evaluate the ability of your bones to accept the implant, as well as to demonstrate how much narrowing of the spinal canal or spinal canal stenosis is present on that MRI and determine your candidacy. Also a DEXA scan. I, uh, I referred to it or rather alluded to it a bit earlier. This is a bone density scan. This is the primary scan that allows us to determine whether your bones would be nice and dense enough to safely and stably accept this device. Also lab work just to ensure that you would be an appropriate candidate and to uh, make sure that you would be safe to undergo this procedure. A CBC or complete blood count, a basic metabolic panel to see how all the metabolites and all the electrolytes are in your body. A PTINR, which is essentially a uh, lab value that gives us an indication of your ability to clot and uh, essentially disallow an overactive bleeding response to procedure. Uh, and PTT is one of the values that helps us in determining this as well. So how is this procedure done? Using, using a small spacer, it alleviates pressure on the nerves. And the graphic in the bottom left, you can see that this device uh, is placed in between those bones in the back. Those are the ones that are called spinous processes. Um, and when I end up deploying this device, it is pretty appreciable on the x-ray that I use throughout the entire procedure, how much opening of that spinal canal uh, and the alleviation of the spinal nerve root pinching uh, occurs during the procedure. So I will place the spacer between the spinous processes and it's through a small tube that is about the size of a dime or the diameter of a dime. Once the spacer is placed adequately, it relieves pressure on the nerves, reduces pain, and it essentially tells your spinal canal that you are in flexion and that your spinal canal is open. And there is a video here that I will try to open up really quick for you. So as you can see here on the video, it looks like it's only showing up as I minimize, but uh, this is a video demonstrating the placement of the uh, spacer. And as you can see, the alleviation of the narrowing of the spinal canal is pretty marked. Uh, quite obviously, you know, this is a larger graphic, but even if we get <clears throat> millimeters of opening of that spinal canal, that can cause a massive improvement in your overall pain complaints. And the, as you can see here, the spinal nerve roots, even uh, millimeters of difference of the opening of the spinal canal can cause a massive improvement in pain complaints overall. So what would you expect after you have your vertiflex procedure done? Everybody has different needs. It would be important to follow the instructions from your uh, pain management physician who does perform this procedure. 
So there would be caring for the surgical site, restrictions on activity I'll go over, uh, recommended activity, which would be light activity, just walking, that would be encouraged to make sure that your body uh, responds well and that you essentially don't get deconditioned after this procedure. And you may be a bit sore. So for caring for the surgical site, it is recommended that you change the bandage daily or anytime the bandage gets wet, uh, that would require that to be changed in order to decrease the risk of infection. Also avoid scrubbing or excessive soaking, such as taking a bath, going into the jacuzzi, uh, you know, Epsom salt baths, as well as going into the pool, as this does increase the risk of infection as well. So there are some limitations to uh, risk, uh, activity that I would recommend as well for about six weeks. So anything strenuous more than lifting weight over 10 pounds, bending or twisting of the spine, because I would not want to have this device essentially dislodge right after placement. Thankfully, as it is very securely placed, it is very unlikely. However, let's try to make sure that we decrease the risk of this occurring for you so that this implant is uh, maximally beneficial for you. Activities such as swimming, golfing, which involves quite a bit of twisting, I wouldn't want that to uh, cause a risk of dislodgement. Uh, tennis, running, and jogging also would be uh, ill-advised as whenever you do plant or, uh, you know, hit your foot on the ground, that causes a bit of vibration and, and potential instability of the lower back or the spinal cord area. Um, and I wouldn't want that to disallow an improvement in, uh, in your pain complaints because of this. So as I mentioned, you may be sore. It has been a while after you get this VertiFlex procedure since you've been able to stand up straight and walk long distances. As a result of that, your muscles may be sore. You may have some soreness at the incision site. It's normal. It should go away after you've fully healed well before these six weeks. So many advantages of this VertiFlex implant. It is a very small skin incision. It does preserve the anatomical structures. Nothing is removed. This is essentially just a device that is placed in and mechanically opens up those spaces via a minimally invasive device that doesn't even need to go further than just the spinous processes or the bones in the back. This is reversible and it is a very minimal operative time. Reversible procedure, meaning that if the VertiFlex procedure gives you great relief, but say there is some type of complication where it's just exceedingly rare, it is simple, quick, and easy to have this device removed and no harm, no foul. And this procedure can be performed with local and conscious sedation. Local meaning that I would infiltrate or inject a numbing agent to disallow the pain from the procedure and the incision, as well as conscious sedation, which would involve the uh, administration or giving a pain medication uh, through an IV that will be placed, as well as a anxiolytic or a anxiety decreasing medication. So the risks, thankfully, are very, very low. The most common risk is a spinous process fracture. Those are the bones that hold and stabilize the vertiflex implant, and those are the bones that are essentially kept apart from each other um, in order to keep the spinal canal open. All cause early rehospitalization, meaning that a patient who comes in and gets a vertiflex procedure for any reason going to the hospital, that is 0% thankfully. 0% risk of early cardiopulmonary or, uh, issues or stroke. Um, also, wound complications, 0%. Neural injury does not happen. Bleeding requiring a transfusion, very, very low risk. Uh, infections hardly ever happen. And a dural tear, which is essentially a, uh, a tear in one of the structures in the low back uh, that may cause <clears throat> a bit of discomfort with, uh, with this procedure being placed. Thankfully, that can be alleviated. So I'll go over a few cases to demonstrate the benefit of this procedure. Uh, so first off, uh, there was a 71-year-old male. He presented in April of 2020 with a diagnosis of moderate canal stenosis and severe right foraminal narrowing. As you recall, that is the exiting area where the nerve roots exit the spinal canal. And this gentleman's narrowing was at L4, L5. So the fourth lumbar or lower back vertebrae between that and the fifth lumbar vertebrae. 
Walking caused him severe back and leg pain for anything greater than 10 minutes. He got relief in a flex position. He said he needed to lean over a grocery cart at the store to get relief, very common. We proceeded with epidural injections. These had helped him in the past through 2018, but this time around, they were not really incredibly helpful for him. After we continued to work him up, it was decided to proceed with a vertiflex procedure at that level that did demonstrate the moderate central canal stenosis and severe right foraminal narrowing at that level. Patient was actually scheduled to see a surgeon in the next few weeks. So he was very happy with, uh, you know, the mention of this procedure. So the vertiflex procedure was performed four months after. And the two week postoperative visit did demonstrate this patient was walking 45 minutes without any pain whatsoever. On his six week follow up, the patient was doing great in all aspects of his pain syndrome. And my second case here, there was an 81 year old female patient who presented May of 2019. Her primary symptoms were right buttock and thigh pain, and this had been going on for five years. She was diagnosed with moderate canal stenosis at L4, L5, and moderate to severe left foraminal or exiting nerve root area narrowing, and moderate to severe uh, central canal stenosis at L3 and L4 or between L3 and L4. She did have short-term relief with epidural steroid injections, did have some instability at L3, L4, but it was not significant. Patient was adamant she did not want spine surgery, understandably so. This patient had her vertiflex procedure performed on the 15th of August. On her two-week follow-up visit, she's doing much better. She's able to stand for prolonged periods of time, compared to prior to the procedure. And as for her six week follow-up, her back pain is at least 60% better and no longer having leg pain. So thankfully she did demonstrate a great benefit with this procedure, which was once again, minimally invasive and did not really require her going to a longer recovery type of surgery. So thankfully the results are real. The Vertiflex procedure uh, has collected five years of clinical data, and it shows that it is effective for lumbar spinal stenosis patients. 90% are uh, uh, satisfied with the Vertiflex procedure overall. There was an 85% drop in patients overall using opioid medication. So even if they were taking opioid medications before, and that was the only thing that was helping out their uh, lumbar spinal stenosis pain, we had 85% of them dropped their opioids altogether as it was not necessary any longer. 81% of patients, uh, uh, sorry, rather, 81% uh, had improvement in uh, physical function overall. And there was a 75% reduction in leg pain symptoms from all of their studies that they had done. So on the right side, you can see real patients that have had this procedure, Gloria, uh, at the age of 75, she had mentioned on the day of her procedure, she went to visit the Butterfly Park in Scottsdale. She felt happy and walked around without any problems. Once again, this was the day of her procedure. And Bill, age 77, he no longer has leg pain. It was killing him before, all the way from the hip down to the ankle. Thankfully for this patient, completely gone. So some frequently asked questions. If I've had prior treatments done, a low back fusion, a laminectomy, radiofrequency, or a spinal cord stimulator, are you still a candidate for the Vertiflex procedure? This would be determined on consultation. So you may still be a candidate depending on your treatment history, as well as the levels that were affected. Um, and during the consultation, we will determine the right treatment option, and there are multiple treatment options if the Vertiflex is not for you. As I mentioned before, this does not require a hospital stay. This is same day. Is it covered by Medicare and Medicaid? Yes, thankfully. Uh, both Medicare and Medicaid do cover the procedure. And the recovery time is recommended to be about six weeks limitation of strenuous activities. 
Will you be able to get through the airport security? Yes, you will. Uh, the device is compatible with imaging. You should not set off detectors, but we will give you, or rather uh, your device representative will give you a uh, medical card to keep in your wallet. And uh, the, the TSA will be more than happy with that. Uh, does this restrict your movement? Well, it really does depend on the patient, but not intended to restrict movement. Because if we end up doing this procedure just in the lower back areas, you have so many other vertebrae that can allow for the rotation, the flexion, as well as the extension of your spine to uh, help you with doing your regular daily activities without any significant limitation. Does this relieve pain immediately? Some do get great immediate relief, but there also can be some soreness around the injection site immediately after. So that is why it is recommended we wait about six weeks for everything to heal for uh, an alleviation of the complete amount of pain. So there are other pain management options, as I had kind of alluded to a bit earlier, for low back and or leg pain, two of which I'll go over in a bit more detail on the following slides. One is spinal cord stimulator, and the other is a lumbar radiofrequency ablation. So a spinal cord stimulator, this is a device that utilizes electrical impulses, and thankfully there are very minimal electrical impulses. This alters how the nerves function and send pain signals to you. Typically a good candidate for neurostimulation is someone who has neuropathic pain or chronic pain. This chronic pain must have lasted for about six months and it's not responding to conservative treatments. As for the neuropathic pain, this is a constant burning and aching sensation for many reasons. It can be in the back, the legs, the arms, or feet. This can be secondary to failed back surgery syndrome. So if you have had a low back surgery, but you don't have the pain alleviated, you may be a candidate. Peripheral neuropathy or shooting pain and or burning pain in the lower extremities. Peripheral ischemia, meaning that there is a blood flow issue in the lower legs. Phantom limb pain or residual limb pain may be amenable to a uh, spinal cord stimulator device as well. So patients who have had an amputation but continue to have pain in the not present limb may be great candidates for this, uh, this stimulation device, as well as CRPS, which stands for Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. This is a very complex uh, disease process, which you know I'll allude to a bit here, but uh, it is um, a an indication for this spinal cord stimulator device as well. So if you've experienced little or no relief from surgery, pain medications, nerve blocks, uh, TENS, which is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator device, or physical therapy, spinal cord stimulator device may be for you as well. And that can be discussed with either me or if I'm not your primary pain doctor with your primary pain physician on follow-up. So the lumbar radiofrequency ablation is another one of the device or one of the treatment options for patients who have primarily low back pain. This is used to treat pain stemming from the vertebral facet joints, which are the joints on either side of the uh, vertebrae or the lower back bones that allow for um, essentially cushioning in addition to what the discs are doing to cushion your lower back and also the nerves. Typically, patients have low back pain, worse in the morning, and improves throughout the day, worse with standing, and uh, worse for prolonged periods of time. Treatment is outpatient, usually 10 to 15 minutes in duration, and we sedate patients for this procedure in order to uh, you know, not allow it to be terribly uncomfortable for them, and it can improve pain for up to two years if it is performed. So several indications for use, uh, you know, I won't read all of this, don't worry, but uh, you know, there has been quite a bit of study on this device and its effectiveness for patients uh, with lumbar spinal stenosis. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can either uh, click the ask question icon to send your question. Um, and further down the line to schedule a consultation, uh, I do recommend you call this number and there are operators available to take your call immediately. Uh, it's 520-345-5100 um, and we are available now so we can take your calls whenever or you may also email uh, at appointments at peaceofpain.com. And actually I'll be uh, you know looking over what questions I have thus far here uh, so I can start answering those for you. So I'll click on the Q&A and you can continue to ask uh, your, your questions throughout here. 
Uh, so one question that I have here, where does this procedure fall in relation to ablation and steroid cortisone injections? So that's a great question. You know, patients who uh, do get uh, spinal stenosis pain and shooting pain down the uh, lateral or the aspect of the legs can benefit from steroid or cortisone injections. Um, but the VertiFlex procedure is a device that would uh, be more of a permanent solution in patients who either have not responded to cortisone injections or they may not be a candidate for cortisone injections for one reason or another. Uh, does hemp help? Um, uh, I suppose hemp, hemp could help. Uh, you know, patients have uh, differential benefits with, uh, with that. Um, but yeah, that would be more so for your, uh, your physician to determine your candidacy for using that. Uh, how many spacers uh, can be installed? Uh, so if you are an appropriate candidate for contiguous levels, um, on the order of one to two uh, are the spacers that can be installed at one time. Uh, so should I make a consult appointment? Uh, I think maybe I answered that. Yes, if uh, you're interested and this does sound like uh, something that would be uh, beneficial for you, absolutely. Uh, I would encourage you to schedule a consultation if uh, you believe you are a candidate for this. And let's see, also, uh, if you have degenerative disc disease, um, yes, this can be very helpful. Um, if you have degenerative joint disease, however, you may also be a candidate. It really does depend on why exactly you have degenerative joint disease. Um, so I would encourage you to schedule a consultation to see whether or not you would be a candidate for this device. Can a person one, run with this device? Absolutely. After that six week period, uh, definitely. I would encourage you to slowly go up in the strenuous uh, or the activity level. Um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, will this relieve the numbness tingling in the feet and toes? Uh, yes, so that is one of the, uh, or actually those are some of the uh, consequences of lumbar spinal stenosis. And if you are determined to be an appropriate candidate for this, yes, that is a plan to allow for an alleviation of the numbness and tingling in the feet and toes. If you had a neck fusion a year ago, still having muscle pain in the shoulder blade area, um, so this is, this is more so a device for the lower back. So anywhere from L1, lumbar level one, down to L5, uh, that is where this device can be placed. Um, and from my knowledge, this is not a device that is done any further up in the spinal cord area. Let's see, say, so if you have if you need more than one disc issue, can we insert more than one? Yes, uh, up to two contiguous levels can be, uh, can be a benefit with this device. Can it be installed in more than one location? Yes, it can be, I believe I uh, answered that one. How long will a spacer last? Uh, so that's variable. Uh, you know, a lot of patients can benefit from this for a long term, um, and it can be absolutely an, uh, a device that would help you out for, you know, throughout your life. It really depends on how quickly the uh, lumbar spinal stenosis and degeneration of the lower back uh, progresses for you. Uh, so that's variable. You take warfarin for blood clot prevention. Uh, yes, so you would still be a candidate. We would just have to work with your prescribing doctor for the warfarin uh, to see if uh, you exactly would be a, a great candidate for this. Um, but yes, it, uh, it would not preclude you from this procedure. Is this the same as a Coflex? So Coflex was uh, a device that was uh, way back in the day, and this uh, many improvements have been made. Uh, it is similar, but uh, you know, uh, a different technology has been initiated for uh, your overall benefit of this. Will this replace the stem wave that has been implanted? Um, not necessarily, uh, but it may potentially be helpful uh, for the lower back issues if you do have a spinal cord stimulator device in. Um, and yes, since it is uh, on the posterior aspect of the uh, spinal cord area or the lower back, it's okay if you already have a device in place, but uh, that would be a determination uh, primarily made by your pain doctor. 
what keeps it in place? Uh, so the spinous processes actually keep it in place. Uh, so that's why we need to make sure that uh, you know you are an appropriate candidate and that you don't have a decreased density uh, of your bones to disallow this from being an appropriate device for you. Okay, so uh, a couple of these other questions are more so uh, questions that might be a bit more involved and, uh, you know, answered on your consultation. So I would encourage you to uh, try to discuss this with your uh, pain doctor. Uh, so there's a, a question also, uh, if you've received only steroid injections, uh, is it recommended skipping radiofrequency or laminectomy? Uh, yes, it, it would be potential. Um, it really depends on what exactly the primary disease issue uh, that is causing this lower back pain for you. So that would be once again, you know, determined on your evaluation. Why this device over ablation? Uh, so this would be, uh, you know, determined based on whatever your dis primary disease process is. Um, so there are different indications uh, for the uh, this device versus a radiofrequency ablation. Uh, yes. Uh, so another question is, can you still use things like HF10? Uh, yes, absolutely. So that is a spinal cord stimulator device that uh, would still allow the uh, safe and appropriate placement of this procedure. Um, so another question, do I do this procedure? Yes, um, I do this procedure. Uh, it is done at our ambulatory surgery center. And uh, one last question here, uh, what are the long-term restrictions for this device? So after the six week period, um, and as you continue to slowly improve on your uh, you know, overall um, activity levels, uh, this should uh, really, really help out for the long-term for you. Uh, so no restrictions really after six weeks. Uh, the only things that I would want to make sure of is that, uh, and your pain doctor might wanna make sure of, um, would be uh, just slowly but surely increase uh, your activity level to allow for an appropriate recovery from this procedure. Um, so it looks like those are all of the questions. Uh, looks like there are some chat questions that I can try to uh, try to answer here. Ah, so uh, it looks like there is a there is a question that is a bit involved. Um, you know, the, the mention of foraminal stenosis at multiple levels, uh, steroid injections uh, have been uh, different relief or variable relief. Um, and yes, this can be done at uh, two contiguous levels. Correct. Um, so it looks like uh, all of these questions have uh, already been answered. If you have any additional questions, I would encourage you to, uh, and let me get to that number once again so I can leave that there for you. All right, so if you uh, do determine that you uh, may be a candidate, please do not hesitate to call us for a consultation, 520-345-5100, uh, or email uh, at the email uh, that you can see on your screen. Um, and any of my uh, colleagues would be uh, more than willing to discuss this with you, um, or you can schedule a consultation with myself. Um, but all of us are, uh, you know, trained in the performance of this device. So I would encourage you to, uh, you know, call our, uh, our office and, and try to get this uh, device performed for yourself and your overall, um, you know, pain issues. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I appreciate it, and I look forward to uh, speaking with uh, all of you. Take care. Bye-bye.